Welcome, everybody. Welcome to St. John Damascene Christology. What could be more central? What could be more important, more significant than how we understand the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, God, and Savior? What could be more important? What could be more significant than the author and finisher of our faith. And what we're going to do with the help of St. John Damascene, the great saint of the church, is to look in particular at the question of the incarnation, the significance of the incarnation of the Son and Word of God. Now, you may already be aware that the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God, our triune God, is already present in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have God, Elohim, we have the Logos, Yahweh, which is an attempt to pronounce the tetragrammaton, the name revealed to Moses on Sinai. That is the name of the angel of glory, the Lord of glory, Christ. And we also have spirit, Ruach, Nevma. So we have Theos, Elohim, we have Yahweh, Yahweh, we have Spirit in the Old Testament, we have the Holy Trinity. And we have been created according to the image of God. We have been created Katikona Theu. According to the image. Who is the image of God? Christ. And I say Christ deliberately, even though in the Old Testament we have the pre incarnate Logos. As St. Cyril of Alexandria teaches us, in the Old Testament we have the manifestation, the main protagonist of the Old Testament is the pre-incarnate Logos. He is at the epicenter of every manifestation of God in the Old Testament as well as in the New. In the New Testament, what do we have that is different? We said that the Holy Trinity can be discerned even in the Old Testament. The Holy Trinity is revealed to us. The first person of the Holy Trinity in the New Testament is revealed to us by none other than the incarnate Logos. And he identifies the first hypostasis of the Holy Trinity as the Father. And of course, what is new is the fact of the incarnation, whereas in the Old Testament it was revealed prophetically, now it is revealed as accomplished and the one who became flesh for our salvation reveals to us the father because he is the express image of the father and we learn that no one can see and recognize Christ as Lord but by the Holy Spirit. 
So all the manifestations of God, all the theophanies in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, are given through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals to us that Christ is our creator and our God. So we come to that which is new, the incarnation. And it's St. John Damascene who says that this is the only truly new thing under the sun. The incarnation of the Son and Word of God, our Lord, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So perhaps I should begin with a word about St. John Damascene in particular and why we've chosen him to be our guide, to be our teacher on this question. St. John's years are from around 655 to around 750. So he belongs to the second half of the 7th century and the first half of the 8th century. This is a very productive period, a glorious period in the history of the church. Three great saints of the 7th and 8th century we have St. John Climacus, the author of The Ladder of Divine Ascent, which we shall be reading traditionally. It is customary reading, especially for monastics, but also for lay folk during the period of Great Lent. And St. John Climacus, his years are from 579 to 649, so he belongs to the 6th and 7th centuries as a point of reference. He's one year older than Maximus, Maximus the Confessor, of course, whose years are from 580 to 662. Again, he belongs to the 6th and seventh centuries, he's one year younger than Climacus. And 60 years younger than Maximus, belonging to the seventh century, really, is Saint Isaac the Syrian, another great master of the spiritual life. Three great masters of the spiritual life. And in the Philokalia of Saint Nicodemus, St. Maximus the Confessor is very prominent indeed. More pages are devoted to St. Maximus the Confessor, who was a simple monk all his life, was never ordained. More pages are devoted to him in the Philokalia than to any other writer. And his spiritual father was Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem, 6th and 7th centuries. He is 20 years older than Maximus. And of course, he's the patriarch of Jerusalem. From 634 to 638, sadly, he was the one who had to hand over the keys, Jerusalem, to the invading Arab Muslims led by Omar. This brings us to St. John Damascene, 95 years younger than Maximus. So he comes after St. Maximus. And the significance of St. John Damascene is that we know him in many ways by virtue of his hymnography, we know him by virtue of his homilies, some significant homilies which he wrote. One of them, by the way, 
is on the transfiguration of Christ. And I treat St. John's presentation of the transfiguration in my own studies, in my book on the transfiguration. His defense of the holy icons, remember 787 is the year of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, influenced by the writings of, among others, St. John Damascene on images. St. John Damascene is also the first to give a rather detailed response to Islam. It's interesting that when he did so, he treated Islam as a Christian heresy. He regarded Islam as a Christian heresy, as a, an extreme form of Nestorianism. We can talk about that in due course. And these are years, dates to hang things on. 787 is the Seventh Ecumenical Council. 843, of course, is the triumph of orthodoxy, the restoration of the holy icons. So there you have, hopefully, a helpful list of references. What else can we say about St. John Damascene? One of his most important and influential works was that called The Fount of Knowledge. And The Fount of Knowledge has three parts. It was written at the suggestion of his former fellow monk and stepbrother, Cosmas Melodus, Bishop of Mayuma. And it's divided into three parts. The first part deals with philosophy. That's called the dialectica. The second addresses the question of heresies. So it goes into the various heresies and responds to them. And the third part is on the Orthodox faith. This is the De Fide Orthodoxa in Latin, which became known also in the West. The most important of the three works, the three parts of the fount of knowledge. Be ye gnoseos. Be ye is the source or the fount. Gnoseos means of knowledge, the source of knowledge. And in these works, in the philosophical part, the dialectica, we see the influence of Aristotle, but also of Plato. Through Maximus the Confessor. And this is the kind of thing that you'll find in any encyclopedic dictionary entry on the Damascene. And I want to address a question here because I recently posted on my blog on our website a response to someone who was asking me whether St. John Damascene may be correctly regarded as the first scholastic because of the way that he systematizes, in particular, this work, The Fount of Knowledge. He presents the Orthodox faith, first philosophy, then the heresies, then the Orthodox faith, in a systematic, rather methodical manner, in a well-organized manner. And they see in him a precursor to Peter Lombard and Thomas Aquinas in the West, where we have, of course, representatives of scholastic philosophy and scholastic theology. What the scholastics did was they used mainly, but not only, Aristotle 
in order to write a kind of analytical, systematic exposition of the Christian faith. And in so doing, they emphasized the role of reason. The scholastics really gave the preeminence to reason, the rational aspect of our soul, meaning that their theology was speculative and intellectualistic. St. John Damascene's theology, by contrast, is not speculative and it is not intellectualistic, even though it is rather well organized. A well organized presentation of things does not necessarily mean that it is scholastic. And we can discuss that point as well as we go along. I think the important thing to bear in mind is that in St. John Damascene's theology, which is a recapitulation of his predecessors, you have apophatic theology, meaning mystical theology, theology which is based on the life of prayer. Theology which is based on the vision of God, the vision of Christ in glory, the vision of the risen Lord, and not on thinking, not on figuring things out, not on speculation. This is very important because it will help you to discern what is orthodox and what is not orthodox. And this really goes back to the whole question of what is theology and who is a theologian? Or I could put it in slightly different terms. What is holiness? What is sanctity? What is deification? And who is a saint? What do we mean when we say saint? And it's my conviction that what happened in the West over time, because during the first millennium, the traditions of the East and the West were the same with some minor differences. But what happened over time, thanks to an increasing influence of the theological approach of St. Augustine, was that you have the introduction of speculative theology. Let me put it a slightly different way. What you have is the abandonment of the biblical and patristic method. And I say method in inverted commas because there is no method as such. But what I mean is there is the purification of the heart, the illumination of the mind, and the deification or sanctification of the soul and body by means of living the commandments of Christ and prayer, noetic prayer, that prayer which in its fullest form is represented by St. Paul when he says, I know a man in Christ was taken up to the third heaven and heard unspeakable words. So the question of whether St. John Damascene is a precursor, a forerunner of the scholastics of the West is incorrect. It doesn't appreciate the fundamental difference in context. Unfortunately, in the West, the translation of the Damascene was 
not satisfactory. It was not too good. Not that that should be in itself a justification, but how the Damascene was received, it was not by means of the best translation. In our reading of St. John Damascene, you will see, as I said, the recapitulation of John's predecessors. You'll see the influence of the early apologists. You'll see the influence of the Cappadocian fathers, in particular, St. Gregory the theologian. You'll see the influence of Dionysius, Dionysius the Areopagite. You'll see the influence of Leontius of Byzantium, who gave us the term en hypostasis, referring to the essence of God or the nature of God, that it is en hypostatic, that there is no such thing as an essence without hypostasis or a hypostasis without essence. Essence is the content of the hypostasis and the hypostasis is the bearer of the essence. And as you can imagine, this becomes very significant when we come to the doctrines of the two natures in Christ and, of course, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So we have many influences on St. John Damascene. I only mention a few of them in passing. The Damascene was also a great commentator on the epistles of St. Paul. And I mentioned that several homilies of a strongly dogmatic character were written by the Damascene. I mentioned his homily on the Transfiguration, but he also has homilies on the Great and Holy Saturday and on the death of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Some of his hymns, his hymnography, have made their way into modern English hymn books. For example, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain, and The Day of Resurrection, Earth Tell It Out Abroad, which were both renderings of J.M. Neal. They are from renderings of the Damacy. And by the way, as a footnote to all of this, the life of Balaam and Joasaph, traditionally ascribed to the Damascene, scholars say is probably not his work. Be that as it may, the Damascene exercised a considerable influence on later theology. The De Fide Orthodoxa, in the inadequate translation of Bergundio of Pisa, that translation was known to Peter Lombard and to Thomas Aquinas. And the authority of the Damascene was invoked in favor of the Latin doctrine of the double procession of the Holy Spirit by the Unionist Greek theologians of the later 13th century and by Cardinal Bessarion at the Council of Florence. So the Damascene's works were known in the Middle Ages, though they were never commented on, nor did they lead to the formation of a school, as did those of Peter Lombard and Thomas Aquinas in the West. Needless to say, in the Orthodox tradition, the influence of the Damascene is tremendous. And we can see this time and time again throughout the patristic tradition. Just a, a casual glance at my notes to the homilies of St. Gregory Palamas will show you 
just how influential he was on St. Gregory himself. St. Gregory read the Damascene very carefully and built creatively on much of what the Damascene presents in his writings, including the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. So that's a brief intro to the Damascene. Let's say just one more word about the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith before we begin reading from it. It's separated into four books. The first book is on God. And when St. John says God, he means God the Holy Trinity, straight away. In scholastic theology, by the way, the categories are God, and then the second category is the Holy Trinity. That's already problematic from an orthodox perspective. God is the Holy Trinity. Our God is a triune God. There is no other God. When Moses experienced God on Sinai, there's no other God to experience. There is Christ, who is at the same time the one who reveals God the Father and who is revealed in God the Holy Spirit. Triune. Every activity of God, every manifestation of God is first Christological and second Trinitarian. That's quite a statement, I know. We need to unpack that and to qualify it as we go along. But we will, with God's help and St. John Damascene. So the first book is on God. God, the Holy Trinity. The second book is on creation. The third is on the incarnation, specifically Christ. And the fourth book is less systematically presented. It treats of certain questions on Christ and some other questions in addition. So, that's the shape of the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. In the West, firstly in the Roman Catholic tradition, but then subsequently also in the Protestant reformers tradition, the Damascene is regarded as the last Greek-speaking father. Curious from an Orthodox perspective, not so much from a Western perspective because in the West what you have is this progressive idea of revelation where you begin with the apostles then you go quickly very swiftly through the apostolic fathers and the early apologists and then you come to the fathers and but mainly the Greek-speaking fathers who are regarded as being influenced by, chiefly, Plato. But you see, in the Latin tradition in particular, the Roman Catholic tradition that follows Augustine, they want to get to scholasticism. So they stop with John Damascene in the East, and they stop with Isidore of Seville in the West. And they say, that's it. That's your patristic tradition right there. Of course, Isidore of Seville is much earlier. And of course, from a, an Orthodox perspective, that is highly and deeply curious because nobody has told us that the patristic period is over. We didn't get that memo. 
we have saints today and they are all considered fathers and mothers just as much as Saint Athanasius the Great and Saint Basil the Great, Saint Gregory Palamas, Maximus, Simeon, so on. We have them with us today. And the theology, the Orthodox believe, the theology is the same. Western theologians will pick at that and find inconsistencies and holes in the Orthodox tradition. The golden thread, they laugh at the idea of there being a golden thread, a tradition that goes all the way from the apostles to the present day. But in fact, there is, and in some ways, that is acknowledged by various Western theologians. But the problem is that they want to pass from the patristic tradition to the scholastic. And so you have the influence of Plato, then you have the influence of Aristotle, you have the Neoplatonists, you have the Stoics. It's not as simple as what I'm suggesting. There are complications along the way. But there's this idea that revelation is progressive. God is revealing himself to us through history, through the world. And he's doing so through human knowledge as well. He does so through Holy Scripture and he does so through the world, human knowledge, knowledge of creation. This is not the case in the Orthodox tradition. There is a continuous, unbroken tradition. And perhaps one of the key missing pieces in the Western view of the scheme of things is the apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers, particularly with such saints as Ignatius of Antioch in mind, Ignatius the God-bearer, because he is a link between the apostles and the early patristic tradition. There is a huge gap there. Another huge gap which we find in Western theology, that theology which follows the tradition of Augustine, because that is not the only Western Latin-speaking theology. We just mentioned Hilary of Poitiers. There's Ambrose of Milan. There's Gregory the Great. Numerous. Hosius. There are many, many saints, and they are not represented by Augustine. Augustine is, in fact, an exception in the early church in a way that is not unlike origin in the East. Now, I've spent some time producing videos and podcasts on origin lately and the reason for that is because he's one of those figures one of those chapters in early christian doctrine which if you do not understand him correctly that is to say in an orthodox way then you're not likely to understand much else not because he is a representative of the Orthodox tradition. Some believe he is. But in the Orthodox Church, he's not considered a father of the Church. And there are reasons for that. And among them is his intellectualistic approach. And insofar as he has a deeply intellectualistic approach vis-a-vis -vis God, man, and the cosmos, he is not a precursor because I don't know how much Augustine was directly 
influenced by him, probably very little, if at all. But the presuppositions of origin, which are philosophical and not theological, may also be found in Augustine, curiously. And there is the similarity. The difference being that in the East, there were figures of sufficient stature who were able to correct origin. They read origin and they corrected origin. Take, for example, John Chrysostom. Take, for example, Maximus the Confessor. There are others. That was not the case in the West. Augustine seems to have flourished in a rather remote part of the empire at the time, which was ravaged by turmoil, invasions, and he preferred to be there, even though he spent a little time in Milan and in southern Italy, but he preferred to be near Carthage and to be a big fish in a small pond. There were not people around him immediately who were able to correct him. And later, of course, we have very soon after the Dark Ages. We'll talk about the Dark Ages when the time comes. But all this is to say that another gaping hole in Western theology, that theological tradition that follows Augustine, is the hypostasis. It would not be too much of a generalization. All generalizations are subject to scrutiny and correction and so on. But it wouldn't be too much of a, an exaggeration to say that in Western post-Augustinian theology, there is no hypostasis. It's a gaping hole. It's missing. It's absent. And this is why, among other things, we have in the 20th century, probably the greatest Orthodox theologian of the 20th century. I'm not referring to Father George Florovsky. I'm referring to Saint Sophroni, the Athenite, whose work could be summed up as a presentation of the orthodox understanding of the person hypostasis. Why do I say all of this as a preamble to our study of St. John Damascene and of Christology in particular? Because Christ is the hypostasis. Christ is the second hypostasis of the Holy Trinity, and he is the hypostasis. We were created in his image. We were created to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, adopted sons of God. And so, with the divine purpose in mind, we begin our look at the teachings of St. John Damascene on the person of our Lord, God, and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The first chapter of Book 3, which is on the Incarnation, is entitled Concerning the Divine Economy and God's Care Over Us and concerning our salvation. Significantly, St. John Damascene says, man then was thus snared by the assault of the arch fiend and broke his creator's command and was stripped of grace and put off his confidence with God and covered himself with the asperities of a toilsome life for this is the meaning of the fig leaves, and was clothed about with death, that is, mortality 
and the grossness of flesh. For this is what the garment of skins signifies. And was banished from paradise by God's just judgment and condemned to death and made subject to corruption. Yet, notwithstanding all this, in his pity, this almost reads like a Eucharistic prayer. Remember the, the Eucharistic prayer of St. Basil? He's prayerful. Yet, notwithstanding all this, in his pity, God who gave him his being and who in his graciousness bestowed on him a life of happiness, did not disregard man, but he first trained him in many ways and called him back by groans and trembling, by the deluge of water and the utter destruction of almost the whole race, by confusion and diversity of tongues, by the rule of angels, by the burning of cities, by figurative manifestations of God, by wars and victories and defeats, by signs and wonders, by manifold faculties, by the law and the prophets. For by all these means, God earnestly strove to emancipate man from the widespread and enslaving bonds of sin, which had made life such a mass of iniquity, and to effect man's return to a life of happiness. For it was sin that brought death like a wild and savage beast into the world, to the ruin of the human life. But it behoved the Redeemer to be without sin and not made liable through sin to death and further that his nature should be strengthened and renewed and trained by labor and taught by the way of virtue which leads away from corruption to the life eternal and in the end is revealed the mighty ocean of love to man that is about him. For the very Creator and Lord Himself undertakes a struggle in behalf of the work of His own hands and learns by toil to become master. And since the enemy snares man by the hope of Godhead, He Himself is snared in turn by the screen of flesh, and so are shown at once the goodness and wisdom, the justice and might of God. God's goodness is revealed in that he did not disregard the frailty of his own handiwork, but was moved with compassion for him in his fall, and stretched forth his hand to him, and his justice in that when man was overcome, he did not make another victorious over the tyrant, nor did he snatch man by might from death, but in his goodness and justice, he made him who had become through his sins the slave of death, himself once more conqueror and rescued like by like, most difficult though it seem, and his wisdom is seen in his devising the most fitting solution of the difficulty. For by the good pleasure of our God and Father, the only begotten Son and Word of God, and God, who is in the bosom of the God and Father, of like essence with the Father and the Holy Spirit, who was before the ages, who is without beginning and was in the beginning, who is in the presence of the God and Father, and who is God 
and made in the form of God, bent the heavens and descended to earth. That is to say, he humbled without humiliation his lofty station, which yet could not be humbled, and condescends to his servants with a condescension ineffable and incomprehensible. That is what the descent signifies. So I'll pause there. But what I want to do is to go through the text fairly closely. We'll compare where necessary. We'll bring in the Greek original. This translation, by the way, is not one that I consider perfect. I think you'll see over time what I said about the absence of hypostasis. That's a big factor in Salmon's translation. Wherever hypostasis is used in the original, Salmon tends to use the word subsistence. Hypostasis is not exactly subsistence. We'll come back to all of this. It's good to leave the last word with St. John Damascene. And I hope I've given you enough in this introduction to whet your appetite for more. Click on the join button below our video and become a friend or reader of the Mount Tabor Academy. Support our drive to introduce the theology and spiritual life of the Orthodox Church to the wider community. Thank you.